Welcome to The Great Song Adventure. We're here for episode four with Carol King. Pretty wonderful songwriter. I'm so happy that she's part of our show. She's your mom, too. Yes, she is. And she came to us wanting to do this interview. So it's a real gift that we got to speak to her in such a relaxed, expansive way. We did. I'm sure we explained it in the first episode, but uh, we didn't ask her. But she came to us and she had been listening to the show and she liked it. And what she really stressed was... I don't want just question, 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 like she often got in interviews. She wanted a conversation, and she had a lot of things she wanted to talk about. And uh, so it turned into a long conversation. We spoke in, in the last three episodes, and then I went to Chicago for Thanksgiving, and she had more to say with just you. You showed you don't really need me around at all, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing, probably. I love having you around. You always you. come out with all these great references. And I said to you off mic earlier, I said, well, you know, when I'm working really hard on this and I'm doing the production and so much editing, I think, hey, Paul's been working on this podcast for 30 years because <laughs> of all the great archives you've done. So you can afford to go off to Chicago and yeah. take a break and leave me with the questions yeah, once in a while. You're pretty good at it. And you did ask a question, which I wanted to ask, and I appreciate you asked it, about the phenomenal, what they used to call back in the day, writing sideways songs. That was their term back then. Uh, of writing songs influenced or imitative of songs that were currently hits, which is something people have always done. Even the Beatles did it. They were imitating songs. But they, they, they come out much different when you do it yourself. But often some of those songs, uh, written by Man and Wild, by your parents, were better often than the songs they were imitating and became more famous. So I'm glad you got into that. That comes in the next episode. That's what songwriters do today still. They listen, they think, well, hey, we need something like that. Yeah, yeah. Only better. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's yeah. the reality of being a songwriter, that you're influenced by other songs. You're someone that loves songs, or you wouldn't become a songwriter. Songs excite you and are part of your life. So that, that's part of it. And also your mom talks about it. She's really loved playing with great musicians. And your mom is known well, with good reason, as being a great musician and as a cat. She's not just considered, uh, you know, just a songwriter, but a really well-respected songwriter because she's such an excellent musician and knows music so well. And she, she speaks about how she just loved playing with great musicians, what an impact they had on her. Yeah, the other thing that's interesting, and this is in the musical, but she didn't feel confident as a singer. She didn't feel confident as a performer. And in the end, she came around to embracing the fact that what she had to offer as a singer was the vulnerability and the authenticity. And... I, I completely know where she's coming from because you see these singers who are just so incredible and you go, oh, well, I'll never be that. But what you have is something different. You know, mm -hmm. what she had to offer was, I can play you the feeling behind the song. And, and people wanted that. And it took playing with Charlie Larkey and Danny Korchmar for her to feel at ease with playing in the band and being treated as an equal as the band player, but also looking over at Danny and having him say, what you got, you know, and, mm -hmm. and her giving it her all and, and allowing herself to be pushed to an, another level. So we, we all need that. And it was great how she told us the whole process of starting off so shy, so introverted. Mm -hmm. And really just caring about writing a great song, how the transformation came going from being a songwriter behind the scenes for other people to one, being in the band, and two, performing her own songs. It's great to hear that all laid out in this conversation we had. It is. And uh, and to realize you know, what it became, because it was really, to us, and it was the first real album from someone who was a singer, songwriter, that this person singing wrote all these songs. And that added a whole dimension that was really important. I mean, the Beatles were singing their own songs, of course. Uh, and that was a change. And that she didn't sing like like Aretha Franklin. She was a wonderful singer, but it was about the writing. It was about the songs as well. And we felt that. She almost seemed like a real person. And that's, I think, why we related to her so much. And I don't know if people realize or remember 
just how huge tapestry was, but it was a phenomenon. It it outsold Sgt. Pepper for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, it really connected at the right time when people wanted something real. It was really great and brilliant and miraculous, but it was real. It was coming from real people. Yeah, it is a thing. Many people don't know this. So when we go into this episode, she starts off talking about the first of three records, mm -hmm. and she refers to it as The City. The City was a band. When she first came to L.A., she wanted to be in a band. She didn't want the responsibility of being Carole King. She was in a band with Charlie Larkey and Danny Korchmar. There was no drummer in the band. They had... Jim Gordon. Jim Gordon. Thank you. And that was the first record she made. And then she made her first solo record under her name called Writer. Mm -hmm. And then she made Tapestry. So when you listen to her speaking in this episode, for people who are not that familiar with the catalog and think Tapestry was the first record, mm -hmm. there were two records before that. The City... And the name of that album was Now That Everything's Been Said. I love the opening song on that, Snow Queen, which was written with my father, Jerry Goffin. And then Writer has great songs on it, too. And then Tapestry came third. So here we go. Goffin and King, episode four. So here we are. You have said that The City, the album The City, the band, uh, Now That Everything's Been Said is the name of the album, you have said that that is the first record you made of a trilogy. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I called it a trilogy after the fact. Uh, I didn't know I was making a trilogy. And it's just really in my head that it's a trilogy because now that everything's been said, first of all, was the first album that I had done since Jerry. Uh, and, and second, which I didn't even do that, I did that in part, I think, with Jerry. We weren't together anymore. I was living in California, but he, he was involved. But it was just, my, I guess, my first California album. So let me just go back. The City album, that City is the group, the album is Now That Everything's Been Said, um, was my first California album. And it was just a stab, just writing songs kind of making demos and recording as demos almost, you know, without trying to make a demo first and then a big production. It was the formation of a group with myself, Danny Korchmar, and Charlie Larkey. We didn't have a drummer. We used Jim Gordon on the album. But it was just a whole new thing for me. I was being... A recording artist. There was no way I was going to be a performing artist, but I was being a recording artist. And there's an energy in the way that that album was recorded. It was really about songs. It was so much about songs. That, to me, was the star of the album, was songs. And then um, the second of the trilogy, in my mind, was the writer album, which I then took solo credit for, even though you know, the some of the players were the same. Charlie and Danny were a part of that. And then the Tapestry album, which really was just a continuation in my mind, generally, of we were doing the same thing we did on the Writer album and Lou was producing Tapestry. And Danny actually said in the interview we did with him, he couldn't, he thought Writer was going to be the biggest thing ever. And when when Tapestry was finished, he knew it was great. But he thought, I thought the last one was great, you know. So. Well, and before that, we all thought the City album was amazing. Yeah. You know, waited for it to go zooming up the charts, and it kind of didn't go very far. Well, I'm just curious, when Tapestry was finished being made, were you waiting for it to zoom up the charts, or were you thinking, well, I thought that about the last two, so I'm not going to have expectations? I didn't even think it about Writer. I did think it about the City album, because that was a group thing. It was more, it was less about me, so I had the confidence, that, yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, in my mind, I realized, the, and the trilogy aspect is, even though there is a difference in that the first album now that everything's been said, was a group credit and a group sort of energy to it. I still see them as a group of three, 
that were in a similar place and time and were had a similar energy because they were all based on the songs always. And I was, even in the city, a lot of the center of presenting the song because I was the voice that presented the song and played the piano. So that's the common thread in all three. You know, people say, well, why was it a group when you first made the the recording of Now That Everything's Been Said? I was... I didn't want to be an artist. I had no, I just wanted to be a songwriter. I was happy being a songwriter. And my voice was, in my mind, suitable for presenting a song. I would go anywhere and miss notes and didn't care because I assumed that the listener could, I mean, not on a record, but if I presented a song, I assumed that the listener would know the note I was trying to make and infer it. <laughs> um, but they I know probably, that, they probably did. <laughs> yes, and and that's the thing that worked because I was I was really good at presenting a song, and that's. But I never considered myself a singer, in, in the terms of a singer. I mean, when I think of a singer, I think of Aretha, I think of Celine Dion, I think of Barbara Streisand in those days, Joni Mitchell. You think note perfect. You think note perfect and with a voice with the range and the quality. I have this horse quality that I remember when I was taking singing lessons as a young girl. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I was in junior high school or something. Um, the, the teacher, whose name I forget mercifully, <laughs> said, Oh, you never make it as a singer. Your voice is too hoarse. And I have thought of that from time to time. Um, I understand what is wrong with my voice, but what I know is right with my voice is it is authentic. It is the conveyor of the song. It's when you hear Burt Bacharach singing one of his songs. He is not the greatest singer in the world, but you know that what you're hearing is authentically the transmitter of that song to the universe. So in that lay my confidence. But other than that, I I wasn't confident at, confident enough to go out as a group. And Danny Korchmar, whom you've interviewed, and Charlie Larkey, whom you've not. Um, Charlie was my bass player and was my husband at that point, I think. Or I, I think he was either my husband or my boyfriend, but we were together then. Um, and they both said, you should go out, Danny. You should be a star, you know, and he used some expletives about it. And I don't want to. I really don't want to. So they finally got persuaded me to be part of the group of the three of us. And that's how we were a group, because that was the only way I had confidence to make an album. And and then once I had that confidence, I felt comfortable enough. And also, I wasn't a performing artist. That was, you know, I had... I had you and Sherry, and I didn't want to go on the road and be a performing artist. And they did. Danny and Charlie both wanted to be touring musicians and get out there and play around the country. So they went into the band Joe Mama, and I stayed as a solo artist. That's how that happened. Well, you were you were saying how Danny and Charlie, uh, one day we were driving around, that Charlie and Danny helped you feel confident at being one of the cats, you know, where you felt you were on equal basis playing with them. It wasn't like you were the protected singer-songwriter and, and then you had the band who knew how to play. You were one of the cats. You felt like part of the band. Well, that, that is true because they, they assumed, they just accepted me from the beginning as one of the cats. I had a different level because I had I was the conveyor of the song and the center of the song. So that gave me a sort of leadership that um, what it wasn't stated or felt in any way except that I had the vision for what I wanted to hear. It's funny you use the word I, I use the word vision for something you want to hear, but vision it, it includes what in my I mind. I get it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I knew what I wanted to hear. And so I could direct the band 
And my joy, my whole life in working with a band is I can be either. So for example, if I work with James Taylor and he's the guy with the vision and he's the guy directing the band, I understand what the cats feel like because then I become a pure cat. And I'm like, what do you need? What it, What can I add to this? And of course, most good cats, they don't have to ask. They kind of intuit. Mm -hmm. what the song calls for. They listen to the lyrics. Russ Kunkel is famous for, I want to see the lyric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said that. And so I know what being a cat is, and I guess I have always been a cat, but as the songwriter and the singer, there is a leadership that cats love, that they enjoy. And if they have suggestions, they make them, and often they'll make the song better. Sometimes they don't, and I'll say, I don't know, that doesn't really work. And... It's, there's no ego involved in it because we're all going the same place and we all trust each other. So being a cat was amazing. Well, that was in, that was in play back then in 1969 before Tapestry, while we were the city. That element was in play and sometimes Danny would take leadership because he, he wrote uh, or co-wrote, and then uh, we did, I think, a staple sing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, mm -hmm. I think, we recorded, which was Danny's idea, and he understood more where that was going. So it really was kind of a team effort. But the cats part of it, one of the things that we did around that time, both Danny and Charlie loved playing. They wanted to play as much as possible. They'd go out and play at night with other bands when they could. And, and when they couldn't or did, wasn't happening, we'd sit around usually our house and, you know, just jam. And I was not, I understood the concept of, jam, of jamming because I had listened to jazz records and gone to see jazz artists, even in New York. But the ability to jam, I didn't think I had it. And it was Charlie and Danny both who taught me that the jamming is simply listening. It's playing and knowing when not to play and listening to where the other players are going and letting what they do take you where you need to go. And in its purest form, when you see a good jam, that's what's happening. The players are listening. They love and respect each other, at least in the moments they're playing. <laughs> Who knows personally? But mm -hmm. And that's what I learned from working with those guys because I had been the leader. Yeah. Because it's always, when am I with a band? I'm with a band when I'm making a demo. It's my song or part my song. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. The song is The song ultimately is the leader. Correct. And I am the interpreter, you know, closest to the song to... Do that. In fact, when I was lucky and blessed enough to be able to record with Jim Keltner and Bob Glob and Jackson's studio when I made this tribute to Dad, Barry Goldberg and Val McCallum, it was an amazing band. And we just had a day, but Jim said to me that we can't be any good unless you are leading us. You know, if people hire us and we're the double scale band for some new artist who isn't confident and is looking for us to dictate the direction or the feel and we don't get enough from the artist, it's not going to pay dividends. It's not going to work out. So I, I learned that it was important for them to feel my left hand on the piano and, and it's often crucial singing to make eye contact with at least the drummer, you know, who everyone else is making eye contact with. So I, I learned and saw it happen again recently. I learned from an early point that it really does come from the song and, and it comes from you leading with the song and what it wants emotionally. And you put me in that situation when you produced my holiday album mm -hmm. as recently as 2011. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do, I think the song was This Christmas. This wasn't even my own song. You know, we worked to, to select other people's songs. Um, and that's a very rangy song to sing. So I had in, in my mind that I wanted to record the band track first. And I would have been, uh, I, I sometimes would sing on a mic with the band. It's called a guide vocal, right? 
And I was thinking it of, of it as that, but then I thought, well, now they know what to do. They don't need me. First of all, it's always better when you're there to sing a guy vocal. They need to feel it. You just decided that that should be, we're going to take a shot at making this the vocal. Just get out there and sing with them and just go for it, you know. Right. And... It, it should be pointed out, you were not playing piano on those sessions, though, because this is something Lou Adler brought up. He even said on Tapestry, and he said this just, you know, across the board, not you, not me, not anyone, but he said generally singer-songwriters who are playing piano at the same time sing better when they're just singing a vocal. That is correct. And, and you know, I experienced... Recently, when I made my All These Hellos record, I was on the mic for every song, looking at whoever was playing drums. I couldn't see all the band members, but I could always see the drummer, and I could always see Dave Way. And I, and I ended up beating a lot of the vocals later, because when at that point, you don't know what it's going to be yet. But some of the vocals were keepers. Some of them just had that, and there was a chemistry between the playing and the singing. And and that happens when you don't have a click track, too. That's true, yeah. But the band is moving with you. Right. Although I found a click track, A, useful mm -hmm. in terms of being able to deal with adding things or whatever. And there is movement around a click track. I totally have felt that movement mm -hmm. because that click track is there. It doesn't stop you from swelling each beat and stretching in between where necessary and you never are out of time. Right. So, but no, but, but as far as the, the guide vocals and stuff, just the, the magic of being in a room with a band for me is incomparable. I am so grateful that I got to do that in my life for so much of my life because there is a, it's nurturing for all of us, actually. Um, as the singer, it was nurturing. I felt supported. I always feel supported by the band. I know that if I lose a bit of energy or for any reason, they're there. They just, they just fill the space where that would have been and then I'm back. Yeah. Um, and that's, for me, part of the joy of being a band. But I also want to go back in time to the city because that was a time when I was just learning. I mean, I had been in the studio with great bands. I mean, the, some of the classic drummers and bass players and guitarists in New York when I was Who making were some demos. Of them? Buddy Saucman, Gary Chester on drums, uh, Al Gorgoni on. Uh, guitar, I think. Just great. And Don to, Costa. You well, said. Don Costa. Don Costa was a mentor because he, when I was age 15, I marched into his office and um, I don't know if the, the secretary wasn't going to let me in, but she did. And Don heard something in me and he really was encouraging. And I didn't even have Jerry's lyrics yet. <laughs> But he was great. Don Costa was one of the great arrangers. He would work for Frank Sinatra and, you know, he put his arranging and producing abilities into my silly little teeny bopper album. So he was great. And his band, you know, his orchestra were just the top players. But um, again, going back to my early days in California. So now I'm jamming in my house, our house with uh, Charlie and Danny and whoever they brought over from time to time that could fit in our living room. Mm -hmm. And um, so I learned the thing about listening to each other and because then it wasn't about the song. We might play the head would be the song. The head is the lead part where, you know, where there's an actual song. And then the jam is what happens afterwards. And usually at the end of a jam, you come back to what they call the head, which I wondered why they didn't call the tail, but that's another question. Mm -hmm. um, and during those jams, it wasn't about the song. It was about musicianship and jamming and listening to whose turn it was. And, and Danny might play some little figure, and I... I'd incorporate that into my next answer to that. Mm -hmm. And I learned 
licks. I mean, lick number 43 is our joke, but, you know, you learn things that you come back and, and draw upon and they're there for you. I never took jamming or great musicianship to where it could go, but I never needed to because I always played with cats who could, and my job was to keep it simple and based around the song. The other thing that I wanted to mention about um, Charlie and Danny, and, you know, they too had their own thing where they were there for each other. Charlie, as a bass player, was rock solid. We didn't have a drummer, so that bass was rock solid. And he often, I didn't tell him to do this, but he often took his parts from my left hand you know, right, the basic yeah. bass. I, went, I wonder how much he improved as a bass player having such amazingly constructed songs to apply his bass playing to because he plays a lot of thirds and fifths and amazing note choices. And I wonder, you know, how much of the osmosis was occurring where he was making your song sound better and your songs were making his bass playing sound better. Totally. And yeah. we were together as a couple at that time. We were married for five years and, you know, had known each other. And so there was this totally symbiotic relationship where we did make each other better. And the rock solidity of a bass is, is just a driving thing for me in a band. And of course, that requires uh, the bass player to be working with a drummer mm -hmm. who can be, you know, compatible with that bass player. And it's a band is a thing mm -hmm. when it's working. There's just nothing better for a musician or a songwriter or anybody. It's just, it's the best. Then the other thing that I, I don't know if you, I did listen to your interview with Danny, but I don't remember if he covered this. Um, Danny and I have this, we're still really good friends today, and I saw him recently, and we still have this conversation. He says, man, I learned so much from you. And when I tell him, you have no idea how much I learned from you, he almost doesn't take it in. He just doesn't, he doesn't think that's possible. But I am here to say today how much I learned from him. First of all, by listening to what he played and jumping off what he played, which he took and got from what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And that happened so much. But even in the jams, I really listened. I really learned so much just from the musicality that he presented. But also, he had a thing that he still does. Anybody who watches Danny, Danny has a band now. I think it's called Immediate Family, now being 2018. Mm -hmm. He has this band called Immediate Family. And it doesn't say Danny Korchmar and Immediate Family because it is just like the city, Immediate Family. And it's him and Wadi Wachtel and Steve Postel and Russ Kunkel and uh, Lee Sklar. And they're, you know, they go on tour and they are, they have written some amazing songs. Wadi Wachtel wrote that song for Warren Zevon. I, it's escaping me right now, the name of it. I don't know. But Danny has written so many songs, some for Don Henley, some for James Taylor, and just others himself. And on those albums, I, I listen to those albums, and I'm just hearing the same thing. And I recently saw a video of them performing in Japan, and I'm looking at Danny, this man who's, you know, like, decades older than this time when I was working with him in 1969. And he still stands in the same Danny Korchmar cooch stance, his legs planted apart and the guitar firmly and confidently held. And he just has this look on his face. We used to call it his hatchet face <laughs> where he just look, he get this um, badass <laughs> look on his face. I am so badass. And that's what he used to do in my living room. And he not only had the I'm badass look on his face, but that look also said to me, what do you got? I know you've got more. 
I know you can do this even better. I know you got more. This is great, but you got more. And that badass look was what drove me to be better as a musician and to become better as a cat. That's great. I will always be grateful to him for that. That that's a great that's a great story. I I have a a few questions about it it's going into probably before that. I did want to point out about the chronology. You just said that you came to California and you made the city record, then you made writer, then you made tapestry. You don't get that chronology when you watch the musical Beautiful it just skips over the first two records and it's that story of almost overnight success and it's good for people to know that things don't really happen overnight it took you a couple of records a couple albums in california to find your feet before you got to tapestry and you worked really hard on those records and you worked with great musicians and it was song centered so it wasn't I just moved to LA and all of a sudden I made tapestry. No, but you know, in the story of beautiful that's compressed. I of mean course. that that was compressed into tapestry. But yes, I mean that's a good point for songwriters and musicians listening to this interview. Yes. The the doing of it has to be the reward. We all need to make money. We all want to you know, and think I've been blessed to do very well and all that, but the doing of it itself, the act of doing it is such a great reward. And the necessity to make money was the inspiration to start writing, you know, when that $25 was what you needed that week. Yeah, and I, my original career path is I was going to be a teacher. Right. And I cannot imagine that I would have lasted with my spirit of independence and like, why can't I teach these kids the way it makes sense instead of the way the book says I have to teach them? I'm sure the there's rules. a lot of teachers dealing with that all the time. Here all in the America time. And everywhere. Yeah. But as, as I went into this other path and I achieved, you know, whatever success, the money can be a driving factor, but... It wasn't as much for me as it was for Jerry. I just loved the doing. I loved the doing so much. Whatever the doing involved, and even all the way to going on tour in 2010 with uh, James Taylor. I don't love touring, but the, the grind is what I don't love. You know, you pick yourself up, you go to another city, you don't know where you are, but... The fun part of it is you come in for sound check and you get your sound and you're, and you're sitting it. with the band again. Yeah, which is, there's nothing like that. It's in the camaraderie and, and, and I have, it's something I've said recently to people that, you know, I've said that if you really want to get good at anything, the way to get good at it is to love it. When you love something, you're intimate with it. You want to show up. It reveals more of itself to you and you get better at it. That is true. So Loving the have, doing. You must have loved it a lot because you got real good at it. <laughs> I did love the doing, and that's that's yeah. the thing. And I guess I've tried to apply that to my life, even when there's, you know, you're doing something that isn't fun. You know, the it helps, like, you know, if you're sweeping a floor, and it's like, I don't really want to be doing this. But then you look at it and you say, well, no, I'm accomplishing something. And each thing you're doing is getting the floor close to clean. In the end, you can... Look at it and say, I did this. And that's the end of episode four with Carol King. And a good place to end where she's really talking about the joy of creation, that regardless of anything, you should take joy in what you're doing. And that's an important lesson for songwriters because it, it's not meant to be torture writing songs. If you bring joy to it, that joy gets injected in the songs. And uh, she certainly knows that. Yeah, that was something that I always heard from her, you know, that she got from her parents. They were, she was an only child for the most part, as she says. And my grandfather was a real stickler about trying your hardest, you know, really doing your best at things. So she and my father both had a real strong work ethic, but it didn't seem like it was hard, painful work. It mm -hmm. seemed like it was joyous work. Yeah, they both loved it. All right, well, our listeners can also find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook for The Great Song Adventure. We're also on YouTube, and you can find us there. And we have a lot of, we did a lot of great episodes before we came to do this wonderful series. 
We did. This is already our second year of this. But, this is uh, our second year. We had to work up to this one. And we have some great episodes coming up. But next week, we have another one. The final episode of the five we have with my mom, Carol Kane. We'll see you next week. <laughs>